Welcome to our discussion on the fundamentals of statistics. There are basically uh, two types of statistics. They call them uh, summary statistics and inferential statistics. So uh, when you want to uh, kind of make an educated guess all right, from interpreting the data, right, that's going to be inferential. Um, and then when you want to just summarize the data, and that's, of course, summary statistics. Now, the word statistics can either describe the actual, uh, you know, uh, discipline of doing statistics, and then statistics are also the name given to the results. Some of their definitions, the population is always the, the large group that you're trying to study. The sample is the subset of that large group that you're trying to study. And that's, you know, the, the group that you're going to gather information on is the sample. Populations have parameters. And those are always described with Greek letters. So whenever you see a Greek letter representing a measurement, then you know that that represents the population. And then sample statistics are the measures that you get from your sample, right? So if you calculate the mean or the median or the mode or any of those kind of things, you know, standard deviation of a sample, those are all statistics. But if you calculate them for a population, those are all called parameters. Okay, so here's a simple example. Agricultural inspectors for Jefferson County measure the levels of residue from three common pesticides on 25 ears of corn from each of the 104 corn producing farms in the county. So if we want to describe the population, the sample, the parameters, and the statistics, right? Well, the population is what we're trying to, you know, figure out what's happening. So that's all of the ears of corn grown in the county. And then the sample, <clears throat> is just going to be those 25 ears that they took from each corn. I'm sorry, from each farm. So the population parameter would be the average level of residue um, that would be on all of the corn grown in the county, which we don't know, right? Because we would have to measure all of the corn. But the statistic we get would be the level of residue that we got from the actual sample. And then from that sample, we can then estimate what the population parameter would be. Okay, so the basic steps in any statistical study is, first you figure out what your goal is, right? What are you trying to figure out? Then you need to choose a representative sample from the population that you're trying to, um, uh, gosh, what's the word? Learn something more. Study would be the word I'm looking for. Then you want to collect some data from that sample and then summarize the data by, you know, running different statistics on it. Obviously, the type of statistics that you're interested in, in, you know, figuring out would be the ones that you would run, right? If you want to know something about the mean, you wouldn't run, you know, the standard deviation, although you, you know, you would to help you understand more about the mean, but you get the idea. You run the stats that you want to, to know about, and then you use those sample statistics to make inferences, right? Make educated guesses about the population parameters, i.e. the same measurements but from the population, and then you draw conclusions based on your results. So here's kind of a, a picture of what's going on, right? You identify your goals, you identify the population you want to study, you take a sample from that population, you collect some data, and then run some statistics, and then from those statistics you make some information inferences about the population, and that tells you what you think the population parameters are, and then from that you can draw some conclusions about the population. Okay, how about an example? Each month the U.S. Labor Department surveys 60,000 households to determine characteristics of the U.S. workforce. One population parameter of interest is the U.S. unemployment rate, defined as the percentage of people who are unemployed among all those who are either employed or actively seeking employment. Describe how the five basic steps of a statistical study apply to this research. All right. So, step one, what's the goal? Well, the goal is to learn something about the unemployment within the population of all Americans. So step two would be choosing a sample, and the Labor Department does that by choosing a random sample of 60,000 households. Step three, they ask questions of those people, and their responses become the raw data that they get. Step four, they run some statistics on that. And then step five, 
they can draw conclusions on the population based on their results. So for instance, if they find out that 20% uh, of all people who are currently unemployed um, have only a call, you know, have a college degree, and 80% have, you know, have a college degree or more, and 80% have less than a college degree, right? So they only have a high school diploma, or maybe even don't have a high school diploma. Then that would make them think that the larger population of people who are unemployed are also most likely undereducated. And so then they could think about, well, then maybe if we institute some sort of um, social programs where we can get these people education, you know, uh, cost free or low cost, then that would help them to come off the unemployment ranks. It's that kind of, you know, idea. That's basically what statistics is looking at and trying to figure out. So a representative sample is a sample in which the relative characteristics of the sample members are generally the same as those of the population. So what that means is, um, let's say again, you're trying to figure out something about the entire uh, United States population. And based on the last census, because that's uh, you know the best thing we have for determining population parameters is the census data, we know that let's say 33% of the population uh, votes Republican and 33% votes uh, Democratic, and the other 33% is undecided, or the Green Party, or whatever, 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 right? You know, some other choice. Then, if you wanted to get a representative sample of the population, you would want to make sure that 33% of your sample, you know, was Democrats, 33% was Republican, and 33% was other. So that's the idea of a representative sample, is that it represents the characteristics of the population that matters, right? It depends on what you're testing for. If you're testing for something that has nothing to do with politics, then you wouldn't care that those things were the same, right? If instead you were testing for, you know, something that had to do with uh, a medical condition, then you'd want to make sure that your sample had the same uh, representative medical conditions as the population you were looking at. You know, it's like the same number of people that had um, high blood pressure or the same number of people that had diabetes and those types of things. Okay, some other common sampling methods. There's the gold standard, the simple random sampling. And this is the idea where you choose a sample of items in such a way that every single sample of the same size has an equal chance of being selected. So basically, it's the idea that any sample of size, let's say 20, has the same chance of being chosen as any other sample of size 20. And I always tell my students the best way to think about a simple random sample, really the only way to, to do a truly simple random sample, is the idea of putting names in a hat and just pulling names out of a hat. Now, obviously, we can't do that uh, for certain things, but it's that kind of idea. You need to make sure that everything that's being chosen is completely randomized, and then that's a simple random sample. Now, systematic sampling is when you use some sort of simple pattern to choose people. So, for instance, if you wanted to find out something about you know, all of the students in, in your current school, you could take a, a list of all of their student ID numbers, right, ordered numerically. And then you could decide that, okay, if we want to um, sample 10% of the entire school, then you could randomly generate a number between 1 and 10. And then whatever that number is, let's say it's 5, then you, you take the fifth number from the list. And then since you want 10%, you take every 10th every number after that. So you go 5, 15, 25, 35. And that would be a systematic sampling. And you can see that it's somewhat random because you randomly chose that first number. But it's not a simple random sample because you have that <clears throat> uh, systematic approach where you're taking every 10th or every 50th or whatever. It makes it impossible for, you know, the first 50 people to be in the sample, which would be one sample of size 50, right? So remember, every sample of the same size has to have equal likelihood. Convenient sampling is just when you sample things that are convenient to you. So like if you're trying to figure out, um, you know, how the students in your school uh, feel about a certain topic and you just sample all the students in your classroom, 
that's a convenience sample. Or if you go and you know sit outside of the uh, student rec center and just ask the first 20 students that go in and out, that would be another convenience sample. And those are bad. I mean, really anything other than a simple random sample has problems with it and, and have inherent biases. Stratified sampling. Um, we use this method when we are concerned about differences among subgroups or strata within a population. So if you're that idea of we're concerned that, uh, you know, Democrats are different from Republicans or different from independents, those would be the, the groups, right? The subgroups or the strata. So we first identify those subgroups, i.e., you know, Republican, Democrat, and whatever. And then we draw a simple random sample within each subgroup. And then the total sample will consist of all the samples from the individual subgroups. So you basically take the population that you want to study, you break them up into subgroups based on some characteristic that you feel has, you know, a relevance to your study, and then you take uh, simple random samples from each of those subgroups, and that's stratified sampling. So um, some common sampling techniques, simple random sampling is you can let a computer randomly, you know, pick things or randomly generate things, right? Convenient sampling usually happens a lot. Um, stratified sampling happens a lot and systematic sampling happens a lot. Those are probably the four most common. So let's see if we can identify what type of sampling we use in each of these scenarios. So you're conducting a survey of students in a dormitory. You choose your sample by knocking on the door of every 10th room. Well, what do you think that is, right? That's obviously systematic because you've got that, that pattern every 10th. Okay, to survey opinions on a proposed new water line, a research firm randomly draws the addresses of 150 homeowners from a public list of all homeowners. And you can see that that would be a simple random sample because it's like the name in a hat, right? They just randomly chose 150 addresses out of the whole sample of addresses, right? Um, agriculture inspectors from Jefferson County check the levels of residue right from three common pesticides on 25 years of corn. We saw this before, right? Um, so they take 25 years of corn from each of the 104 corn producing farms. Can you see how that's stratified sampling? Because you took the entire population of a corn and you broke it up into subgroups of each individual farm and then you randomly sampled from within each of those farms. So that's a uh, stratified sampling example. And lastly, how about anthropologists determine the average brain size of early Neanderthals in Europe by studying skulls found at three sites in southern Europe? So by studying skulls found at, at selected sites, the anthropologists are using a convenience sample. Right? They, ha they really have little choice because it's not like you know these skulls are just everywhere. So they have to go with what they have. So that's why it's a convenient sample, and that's you know why they would choose that. So bias happens whenever the design of the study favors certain results. So usually bias comes into play because of bad sampling techniques. But it can also come in from other things. In an observational study, researchers just observe or measure characteristics of a sample, but they don't influence or modify those characteristics. So, you know, it's the fly on the wall kind of thing. You just stand back and take notes. And that's an observational study. Whereas an experiment is where researchers um, are actually involved and they apply a treatment to some of the members and then uh, a placebo, right? So a control group. You have a treatment and control group, and you look at the effects between the two. So that's the big difference between the two. So like I said, you have that treatment group and the control group. The treatment group gets some sort of different thing, right? It doesn't have to be medication. It has to just be a different treatment. And then the control group gets a placebo, right? They don't get the treatment, and then you see if the two groups um, end up being different on whatever it is you're trying to measure. And the placebo is is that fake treatment, right? So um, medication is pretty obvious. You know, you give one group the medication, you give the other group sugar pills, right? Pills just don't have anything in them. So nobody knows who's getting the real drug. But a treatment could be something like you've come up with a new um, therapy method that you think helps, you know, at-risk youth. Well, one group would get the, the new therapy method, and then the other group, you would just, you know, sit down and talk to them or something, you know, that wouldn't actually be a, a, a truly therapeutic. Now, you wouldn't normally do things like that because, you you know, doctors have these Hippocratic oaths and they don't want to, you know, deny their patients, uh, you know, the best care and that kind of stuff. So it gets kind of tricky. That's why a lot of it's hard to run experiments. 
Blinding is just a term where it says um, the, uh, the members don't know if they're in the treatment group or in the control group. And then um, double blind, right? So single blind is when the participants don't know. And then double blind is when both the participants and the experimenters don't know. So the people running the experiment also don't even know um, which group is getting the placebo and which group is getting the treatment. And that's important because sometimes if the researchers know, they tend to um, kind of introduce bias without even, you know, wanting to or trying to. It's kind of a subconscious thing. So for each of the following experiments described, let's see if we can identify any problems and explain how the problems could have been avoided. So a chiropractor performs adjustments on 25 patients with back pain. Afterward, 18 of the patients say they feel better. He concludes that the adjustments are an effective treatment. Well, what's the problem with this? Well... The 25 patients who receive adjustments represent a treatment group, but this study lacks a control group, right? He didn't, he should have had some patients that he just didn't do anything to. Um, he could have done better by hiring an actor to do fake adjustments, but you know, that would be, you know, opening up litigation. Um, and the, so that's why things don't normally happen as experiments. How about a new drug for a type of attention deficit disorder is supposed to make the affected children less disruptive. Randomly selected children suffering from the disorder are divided into treatment and control groups. Those in the control group receive a placebo that looks just like the real drug, so the experiment is single blind. Experimenters interview the children one-on-one -on -one to decide whether they became more polite. What's wrong with this one? Well, because the, um, the researchers knew which which kids were in each of the two groups when they were interviewing them. That's a very um, subjective thing when you interview someone and then determine whether or not they are polite or more polite. So they could, you know, they could see politeness where politeness didn't exist more if they knew the kids were on the drug, you know what I'm saying? So they would, they would tend to think the kids were more polite before they even talk to them, even if it was subliminally, and then that's going to affect how they rate the kids. So it would be much better to be a double blind study because then that would keep their, their ratings, uh, their subjective ratings would be, you know, more objective. Okay, a, retro, a retrospective study, or what's called a case control study, is an observational study that uses data from the past, such as going back and looking through old records or looking at old um, research results, old uh, interviews, things like that. Um, and then the sample is naturally divided into a group of cases who engage in the behavior under study and a group of controls who did not. So you can go back and look through um, medical files and find out, you know, people who smoked and people who didn't smoke and then see if the smokers, uh, you know, had more um, cases of, you know, blank. That's a retroactive study, or re sorry, retrospective study. So for each of the following questions, what type of statistical study is most likely to lead to an answer and why? So what is the average income of stockbrokers? Well, an observational study can tell us the average income of stockbrokers, and we only need to observe, uh, you know, the, the data. So that'd be the easy. Do seatbelts stay save lives? What do you think? Yeah, retrospective study, right? You go back and you look through... Uh, crash data and see, you know, what percentage of people died in an automobile wreck that were wearing seatbelts versus those who died who weren't. Can lifting weights improve runners' times in a 10-kilometer race? Okay, well, we would need to run an experiment for this one um, with a control and an experimental group, for sure. And then how about, can a new herbal remedy reduce the severity of colds? Here we would want to use double blind experiment so that um, no, because we're talking about reducing the severity. So again, it's kind of a subjective thing. It's not an easily measured thing. Last couple things we want to talk about is the margin of error is used to describe a confidence interval that is likely to contain the two pop, the true population parameter. So a confidence interval is basically when you run statistics, so let's say you have a sample and you get a mean, so the average of your sample is 10. You can't say then that the average of your population is 10. The likelihood of those two things being the same, the probability of those two things being the same, is almost zero. So what you do is instead you put a little interval around it. You say, okay, it's 
likely that the population mean is somewhere between 7 and 13, right? We're at plus and minus 3. So you've seen things like this when they talk about, you know, in elections, and they talk about, well, so-and-so is, is going to win the election, um, you know, with plus or minus 3 uh, points. Well, that's percentage points, right? So that plus or minus is the margin of error. Our last example is just like what I was talking about with election results. And they say the poll finds that 52% of surveyed voters plan to vote for Smith. She needs a majority, more than 50 to win the runoff. The margin of error in the poll is three percentage points. Will she win? Well, 52 minus three is 49, and 52 plus three is 55. So we can be 95% confident that the actual percentage of people planning to vote for her is between 49 and 55. And because that interval leaves open the possibility of either, right? Because at 49% she loses and at 55% she wins. You can't say for sure, or you know, even with 95% confidence that uh, she's gonna win. All right, and those are the basics of statistics.